Um, oh, he wasn't a cross dresser most of the time, unlike me and Dell. Cross dresses all of the time. Dell looks really posh this week. You are almost as if he looks like he's. Uh... <laughs> Dell, have you sorted out all your world's problems? Yeah, more or less. Oh, you still got one or two. Do you know, was it true last week I read that your, your, your brother-in-law had cut down your bloody tree? No, my uncle. Why? Because he was doing the garden and he just thought, oh, may as well clear it all. Oh, he was cut, he cut the tree down? Yeah. What kind of tree was it? Pear. Oh. oh. So, so did you actually manage to recover the tree? No. No. <laughs> Did it have pears last year? No, it, it didn't. It has, yeah, it had pears last year. This year, it's um, it didn't have them. Oh. I, oh. Think it's got, I think it's and got. I think I think it was a case of he looked at it and thought, I thought there was a pear tree here. That's not a pear tree. There's nothing on it. <laughs> oh, how many pears <coughs> last year? Were they any good? Yeah, yeah, they're um, like uh, Williams pear, that oh. style. Oh. Um, got to pick them and write them in the house because yeah. they go spongy if you leave them on the tree. Right, okay. And they're, they're quite big, or well, were quite big. <laughs> All right. Oh. Del, my, my heart goes out to you. I'll tell you what, Del, in <laughs> West Wales, right, you can have as many apple trees as you want. In fact, we've we've planted about um we've planted about ten so far. Oh right. So uh, you know, the apple trees are anyway, let's get rid of the blooming thing on the screen now. Let's stop stop that. Right. Anyway, so there's there's four of us today, so let's get on with it. Bill can't make it today because he's being a right numpty, right? Um, I've already mentioned, uh, we're starting this minute anyway, so Dale's going to probably say he's got to go at two o'clock, so there you go. <laughs> um, and, um, and we're going to be looking at, as I, a, a person in history that is very much in with the vein of, um, you're obviously the, the Roman army fighting all these different people, while well, Julius Caesar's um, up against us Britons and then we've already looked at Verica and um, um, Arminius uh, with Teutonburg in 9 AD so we've already done that one we've done Boudicca 6061 Jessica did Vertingetrix with you at 54 BC we've done Spartacus um, was that 78 years BC or thereabout we're looking at Julius Caesar now so it'd be good to sort of a little bit of background about Julius Caesar um, and I know, I know we're in good company today because uh, Richard is a retired Roman veteran that fought alongside Julius Caesar. <laughs> and he picked his missus up in a, in a brothel in Cardiff. But that, that's another story. Um, I've given away all his secrets. Don't worry, she'll have her own back on um, Friday, won't she, Rich? Oh, yeah. Oh, you know what? You know what? We love our Pauline. So, uh, right, okay, so, oh, I've got to put my image up here as well. The only reason Richard does this is to see me. Well, okay, Rich, that's, uh, uh, I've got my image up on the screen, yeah? No. There I am. Right. You can't, you can't get any better than that. I've got all these guys behind me. Oh, you know, there we go. <clears throat> uh, looks a bit weird, doesn't it? It's just sort of whatever. So what do we know about Julius Caesar, Del? Just one word. And no detail round to just one sentence, Del. Go on, chuck it in there. Del, I can't hear you. Your mic's off. <laughs> Go on, Del, give it to us. Oh, yeah, he was um, Go on. killed in the Ides of March. Yeah. That's right. And the thing is, I think he knew it was going to happen. And apparently... He, he probably wasn't well anyway, and he just thought, well, this is a good way to go out, you know? Yeah. Um, not seriously, now. It, 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 it's, it's, I, I, we would do Julius Caesar and all about his life, but we're not doing that today. But um, I, I think he wasn't too well, and I think he went out uh, big time, um, 44 years BC. He, he, he went out, it, it's like Julius Caesar went out, and it was like almost as if... Um, he wanted to go down in history, and he did go down in history. That's it. You couldn't get more famous than Julius Caesar. Well, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, and a few other people. But 
There you go. Uh, Pat, what do you know about Julius Caesar? Just, just spit it out there. <laughs> I was just going to say he's the most famous one. You know, you always hear about him and no one else. Oh, yeah. come on. I can't name any other emperors. <laughs> oh, all right. Oh, okay. If you were going to mention three famous people in history, who would they be? Forget, would, would one of them be Julius Caesar? Yes, yes. Who's the other two? Well, we got Genghis Khan. Alexander oh, nice. the Great. <laughs> who, who the Great? Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, and Julius Caesar. That's not bad. Do you know what I'm going to do? <laughs> Richard. We're not going to ask Dell, right? Because he'll come up with the aliens. Right. <laughs> um, Richard, um, who are the most. What? Tell us something about Julius Caesar and who are the most three famous people in history. You, you, do, your, you do your Julius Caesar fact. Go on. I think he's the most well known of any. Roman, I suppose he's one of the most famous people in history. Oh my Everyone's god, everyone's heard of Julius Caesar. Yeah, okay. Two other famous people in your book, then at the top of the list three. <laughs> the Attila the Hun, I think. All oh, right, okay. You did Gem Gis Khan, that's interesting. Attila the Hun, right? Go on, go on, one more. <laughs> Winston Churchill. Oh, oh for uh, heck. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Ask me who I'd go for. All right, Dan. Uh, I would go for um Napoleon. Uh, um and I might go for Robert E. Lee. No. Um which has upset, has upset Pat already. And at the at the top of the list, um <laughs> Oh God, that that's that's a really difficult one. Another another famous because I come across so many figures in history every week. Charles Manson. Shut up, you tart. <laughs> Charles Dwight Manson. Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower. Teddy Roosevelt. No, hang on a minute. You're trying to level it out between <laughs> a Confederate general <laughs> and somebody in the Union. You know, um, pro pro probably. Um, oh God. Grant. No, no, well, look, it's my list of three, for God's sake. I didn't even... something. All right, then, Owen Glyndour, that's it. Owen Glyndour, and he's up there. Owen Glyndour, actually, I'm struggling. Owen Glyndour or um, Llewellyn <laughs> Apgruffid, Llewellyn the last. That's a really bit of a struggle. So Owen Glyndour or him, Napoleon and Robert E. Lee. <laughs> oh, go on, Dell. you give us your... No, go on, you give us your three. Well... On the Julius Caesar theme, as Mark Antony, Cleopatra, Ptolemy. Mm. All right, then, are they in the top list of three most famous people in history? Yeah, apart from all the Welsh ones and the aliens. <laughs> right, let's move on. I knew that was a stupid question. That was a really <laughs> daft question of mine. <laughs> right, OK, so um, anyway, we, we have got a couple of people who joined us online anyway. So welcome to you guys. And... So we're going to look directly at these images and see what we can get through. If we don't get through this all today, we can do a bit next week. So, right. Um, are you seeing this on your screen? No, you're not. You're not seeing anything on your screen. There you go. Um, right. Britain, first invasion, Brit Britannia. Right. Mm -hmm. So this makes it quite easy for me. Right. And the reason why, if we talk about, um, if we talk about was the next invasion by an emperor, just by just by Claudius, right, in AD 43, I would then start to argue that maybe Caligula actually came over here as well. So, yeah, I so it's easier to do Julius Caesar because there is no real Roman invasion that we know about before Julius Caesar. However, mark my words, if Julius Caesar hadn't have written this down in his own annals, right, um we might not know whether Julius Caesar invaded or not. There, there is other evidence to say that Julius Caesar had an invasion and all the rest of it. But actually, the detail, we wouldn't know. We would know very, very little. Yeah. So, so there they are, looking out. It's a, it's a bit like a scene of um, the, the Germans invading, um, if they had invaded in 1940. You can imagine us all with spears and none of our weapons that we abandoned at Dunkirk, you know, all that type of thing. 
Um, but is this the, is this a little bit of truism? Maybe it's probably the best truism you can actually get because all the other images that we look at are really blood blood curdly. Um, do you know? Do you remember that image that we used last week? And I said that this is one of the best images portraying the sacking of of uh, Colchester when you had those 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 ex Roman Marines and military on the steps of the Temple of Claudius. And I said that looks really good. Uh, this is probably the best of the images that we got this week. So anyway, let's just tell you a little bit about uh, this guy, Julius Caesar. Let's just try and get into his his mind, try and understand him a little bit. Um, what I should have said at the beginning, who's the most famous person in history? Right? I'm sure that maybe two of you would have at least come up with one of them would have been Julius Caesar anyway. So what we know is that this invasion of Britain was part of the big thing, right? Was part of the Verting Getrix thing, was part of the Gallic Wars, was part of the wars, wars in Gaul. It was part of Julius Caesar putting two fingers up in the air, two rampant fingers up in the air saying, I am a man going to be recorded in history. Yeah, Pat, this is all about men today. This okay. is all about male privilege, right? And yep. you know I hate doing those types of lectures, but unfortunately, <clears throat> though, that's the only boot that we've got today, right? Um, other than the lecture that I gave yesterday that was 50-50. So there you go. So on the first occasion, Caesar took with him um, two legions. Now, the first occasion, 54 years BC, but actually there was another planned invasion in 56 years BC, uh -huh. right? So Julius Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar was a chap um, who had become, who had been a consul, had be, had himself then become a dictator, which which people weren't happy with. Uh, he had been married at least four times. He divorced Pompeia, uh, rather interesting name, is is his wife to the last of his days, um, Calpurnia. You all hear about Calpurnia. That's a really popular name. Calpurnia, he married in 59. And she she obviously, you know, to his death in, 50, uh, in, in 44 years BC. Right. So we know that he had at least three children, Julia, um, Caesarion and Augustus. But Augustus was adopted. Right. Augustus was an adopted um, adopted son. Right. So Augustus is the one. Who is the other name for Augustus is up to actually Octavian, right? So yeah, this is the thing. That's one thing that I would say that uh, most Roman leaders leaders adopted a son. Um, I, I, it's it's a weird thing. I don't know why that is, but Mo, and, and Augustus went on to become this great Roman leader of of, of, of the of the first emperor. Actually, Augustus was the first emperor. His adopted son was his first emperor. Was the first emperor. Julius Caesar was not an emperor. He was a dictator. But people sort of think of him as an emperor. So you lot are excused for referring to him as the first great Roman emperor, right? But he was his actual title. He was actually a dictator, right? He was born on the twelfth of July in the year hundred years BC. Mark it well. And he lived, alas, 54, 55 years, right? And he was assassinated by a number of stab wounds. Yeah, so um, so this is the thing. He, he, a great general, um, leader of the armies in the G Gallic War. Before de defeating, they, there was a war against Pompey, all right, okay, um, um, in, in a civil war. Um, and basically, he, he governed the Roman Republic as a dictator, so it's a bit like Boris Johnson saying, I'm a dictator, um, but you can have elections, right? I, I, I'm I, going to remain here, right? Yeah, this is what I'm going to do, right? We can have elections, we can have political parties, but I am the one ruling whoever's elected, right? So this is what's happened. So there, there was this... Um, there was this war. There was a lot of warring in 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 the early part of sort of Rome being established as an empire. Rome became an empire because um, the the likes of Octavian Augustus defeated Mark Antony that Dal mentioned and Cleopatra. But that's all another story, right? But the Ides of March, the fifteenth of March, fifty four years BC. That's the date. Mark it well when he died. And then there's a bit of turmoil. There's about 15 years of turmoil. Oh, oh, mind my French, 
Octavian is a bit pissed off. There is that um, being the adopted son of Julius Caesar, right? The Julius Caesar has been assassinated. Right. So there's all that sort of stuff. Do you know what we should do? I, I, I know we've already looked at the assassination of Julius Caesar. I know we've already done that in another Roman class. I know we've done that. So I don't want to repeat that. But one thing about Julius Caesar is always going to be remembered. He's on coins. Everyone. And that's the thing, you see, the title of a Roman emperor wasn't um, Emperor Dave. Right. It was Caesar Augustus. So in other words, the Julius Caesar's name, Caesar, is the title given to an emperor. So it, it's, you know, Caesar, whoever, Caesar Constantine. However, to become the over, this is where it gets confusing, right? To become the big emperor, you had to become Augustus Caesar. Because what happened in the Roman Empire, as the Roman Empire developed, you had Augustus Caesar, who was, who was the big emperor, and you used to have a couple of Caesars, sub leaders below him who were who called Caesars, right? Anyway, forget about that. Um, so what I'd like to do, like going back to this invasion, let's get straight into the invasion. A, a tiny little bit of information about Julius Caesar, I may say, but we need to get into this. Oh, do, doesn't this look like Hollywood? It really, really <laughs> does. I'm sure that's a blemish poster from a Hollywood film. It looks it. Um, it definitely does. Um, that's the um, Aqu Aqu um, Signifer, who, who was actually the standard bearer um, or the standard holder, uh, holder of a Roman legion. Um, but we're going to come on to that image and what that image actually means. So anyway, so let, let's um, let's get into Julius Caesar's invasion of Britain. So one thing it said that Julius Caesar had to kick ass, right? He, he needed to get over here. He needed to sort out the Britons because the Britons were being a bit of a pain, right? Because it used to be said, and if some people agree or disagree, right? The reason why Julius Caesar invaded Britain, um, some say, is because it was there to be conquered. I came, I saw, I conquered. Uh, Vini vide vice. Um, and, 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 yeah, that, that's that sort of thing that said. That's the Latin statement. Um, but the one thing is, is that um, it's likely that Julius Caesar invaded because um, the Gauls were being supplied with, with weapons by the Britons. And also the Gauls were being supplied with men to fight. So it was a bit like fighting the Germans, fighting the Russians in the Second World War. You could never defeat the Russians because more of them would keep coming from Siberia um, and you couldn't defeat them. Right. So if Julius Caesar thought this, he thought, I can't defeat these bloody Gauls. They keep coming. <laughs> they just keep coming, you know. And actually, actually, the story of um, that, that, that story, um, Asterix, um, Asterix, could be based on this whole thing. Because Asterix couldn't be defeated until the Romans invaded Britain. Because in the story of Asterix, my, my, I can remember that my um, a Chinese boy in school, because my, my, one of my teachers was really racist in school. Um, he, he said to Tommy, who was from Hong Kong, he said, uh, he said, Tommy, um, what's your favorite books? Um, and he said, oh, he said, Asterix and the Gauls. He said, it, he, he said, didn't say Gauls. He said, Asterix and the Gauls. And my English teacher took the piss out of him. Asterix and the Gauls. So uh, that's where I really come across racism. And well, that was from a teacher when I was in school. Um, anyway, Tommy used to love these books uh, about Asterix. And he used to have the Asterix cartoons on television and all the rest of it. And it was because Asterix couldn't be defeated because they would always have these weapons. And, and they would have all these men. And, and the Romans couldn't defeat them. So, so basically, Julius Caesar needed to invade Britain to kick ass, right? But he thought, hang on a minute, right? We may as well conquer Britain at the same time. Julius Caesar had no idea how big Britain was. He had no idea. He had absolutely had no idea. Um, and so the first invasion in 56 uh, BC didn't succeed. The invasion of 55 BC sort of succeeded. And the final one in 54 BC, um, technically the third invasion, but in my notes to say in the second invasion, Pat's getting confused. So there are three invasion dates, 56, 55, 54. 55 actually took place and 54 took place as well. Yep. So it's a bit like the Operation Sea Lion of the Second World War. It never happened. Right. The Germans didn't invade, but um, they, they, they were going to. 
But actually, these other invasions actually succeeded, 55, 54. And the one in 54 had an, an amazing number of ships involved in the invasion. 628 ships carrying um, in, in the region of 30, 35,000 men and 2,000 2, cavalry. Right. So you just think about that. Right. Um, Dunkirk. Um, to evacuate, what was it, 150,000 men from Dunkirk? I can't remember the exact figures. They needed thousands of ships to take them off the beaches. To invade Britain, The um, in the vessels that they had, they needed uh, nearly 650 ships to invade, uh, 628 to be precise. But then again, who's counting? You know. So that's a lot of the legionaries. We don't know the precise figure. It was five legions altogether. The final invasion of 54 BC, 30,000 men, 35,000 men and the cavalry and the horses. There's a lot going on. Um, the, the force was so imposing that the Britons did not dare contest Caesar's landing in Kent. Waiting instead, he began to move inland. Caesar eventually penetrated all the way beyond the River Thames, which we'll have a look at, forcing the British warlord Cassivellaunus. Love it. Casavalanus, nice one there, to surrender. Um, in other words, what happened is 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 the idea that um, you know, with the surrender of this great leader Casavalanus, and then uh, a Roman client state was set up um, underneath the Tranavantes, which was an ancient British tribe. Um, there, there was like a leader called Mandubracus, and Mandubracus was the Roman leader. No, it was a, was a native Briton who was to be the Roman sort of imposed leader um, on the Britons. So in other words, in a way, even though Julius Caesar didn't conquer the whole of Britain, um, the, the Britons, British surrendered. So therefore he did. That's it. It's a, the same analogy as what happened in the Second World War. When, when the Germans captured Paris, uh, the French surrendered and there, there was the Vichy, Vichy state. And there was the conquered bit of, of France, right? Um, that's what we're talking about. But eventually the Vichy, Vichy state um, sided with the Germans anyway. But that's another bit of history. Um, so what we do know, the, also the other thing as well is, I, I've given you two reasons why Julius Caesar invaded, right? The other reason is that, is that um, the Romans had known for hundreds of years that Britain itself was in fact full of various uh, minerals and uh, metals and it had tin it had copper it had all these wonderful things um, and we know about from early writings by a Carthaginian sailor uh, a Him Himco, um, Himilco um, a Carthaginian sailor back way back in the 400s he, he wrote about Britain he said about <coughs> he said about all the tin and all the rest of it so you you've also got um, you've also got stories about um, um, You've also got other stories about other explorers managing to get to Britain. But the main thing is, um, is that what we do find is that um, Britain during the reign of Julius Caesar had an Iron Age culture um, and had a population of a, probably up to four million people, which, which is quite, quite a big chunk, up to four million people. When the Romans eventually conquered Britain, um, when they invaded proper in 43 AD, the maximum population of Britain probably got to about 7 million. And that's all, that is the natural population of Britain, 7 million people. Today it's 70 million. So that's why we have problems. So, um, and the other thing as well is, I always say this, that if Britain hadn't have been, con if had Britain, Romans hadn't come over to Britain anyway, Britons would have started to develop their own towns and various other things. So G Julius Caesar's written account of Britain says that the, um, that the Belgi of North, Eastern Gaul had previously conducted raids on Britain, establishing settlements in some of its coastal areas, and that within living memory, um, the king of the Susonis had held power in Britain as well as in Gaul. So the Britain, the, you know, there was this link, right? There was this link between the Britons and the people of Gaul, right? There, there was a, a link of blood. Uh, there was a link of brotherly love. So, you know, this is why we're talking about the Britons coming over, helping, um, helping the um, helping the Gauls when the Gauls were, were, were under stress. OK, another little bit of an illustration from the year 54 BC. There's the signifer. Basically what it said, right, 
He don't let the standard bearer get captured. He's saying, come on, boys, come on, it's glorious in the seas. And they're saying, bugger this, we don't want, we don't want the Britons capturing the standard. <laughs> right, but it, it might not be that this event actually happened. Well, actually, the event of the sand standard bearer jumping in the sea, if you, if you listen to my other notes that we've already mentioned, is that um, in 54 BC, the Britons didn't resist along the coast. So this this scene didn't happen in 54 BC. It probably happened in 55 BC when the Britons did resist along the coast. That's when the Signifer went in the water. He said, come on, boys, follow me. And the standard's going to be taken, right? Which would have been an absolute that, the shame on Rome for your standard to have been captured. So in other words, he just jumps in. He's a bit like um, a little child that, that climbs up a tree and you've got to climb to the top of the tree to get the child down because the child's being annoying. That's what happened. That's what happened. So so what happened in uh, – here we go, a little bit more detail. Let's, let's just check the detail in here as much as we can just pour into your mind. So there you go. So what it is, um, Caesar claimed this – is, this is him claiming – in the course of his conquest of Gaul, the Britons had supported the campaigns of the Gauls against him. And the, 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 the Belgi people of, of Britain and France were basically saying, you know – Help us. Yeah, we're your brothers. Yeah, okay, kept on helping. That, 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 that's, that's what happened. Um, and, um, and basically, the, the, the people of Gaul, um, the, the Venati tribes and the um, Armorica uh, tribes, um, would control seaborne trade to the island, calling um, in aid from their uh, British allies to fight for them against Caesar in 56 BC. Now, the um, writer Strabo um, wrote. That, in other words, in 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 other in other words, any rebellion. Here there was a rebellion in 56 years BC. The writer Strabo said that there's a rebellion occurring, and we can't do anything about the rebellion um, because th there's an endless supply of soldiers and arms. We've got to do something about it, you know. Let's organise an expedition. You know, let's do it. You know. So. Uh, so the expedition was planned in 56 BC. It would have happened in 56 BC. But because of stormy waters and all the rest of it, right, it didn't occur. Do you know how difficult it is to invade Britain? It, it, took, them, it took them several years to work out. This is, this is the D-Day landings, right? Um, there, there was that one window on the, on the 6th of June for, for the Allies to invade. They, they, they had planned it for, for, for probably two years. Um, and if if that window hadn't have happened, there wouldn't have been the D-Day landings. So for Julius Caesar to have invaded, to make a, a success of an invasion the other way around, the other way, obviously, the, the water channel's different and it's from the other direction, right? it's still the same problems with the sea. It's very choppy seas. So it's going to have to be late summer that when the seas are relatively calm, sort of, a, a, sort of late summer, sort of in your August, maybe coming into September, right, before the weather gets really bad. Um, and the other thing as well is, this is, this is going to sound odd, and I don't know if, um, I don't know if Jessica mentioned this, I certainly didn't mention it when I, when we did the, uh, when we did Verica and the Teutoburg Forest in 9 AD, there was what's called campaigning season, right? You don't fight after, say, September, right? And I think this is what Julius, uh, this is what Napoleon um, and Hitler should have learned from. You don't invade or you don't fight wars in the winter, right? So, so it said, it said that if this was late August or September, right? Julius Caesar was campaigning rather late. There was a time of year that you campaign and then you leave it, right? So, in other words, boys, come in. It's lovely. It's lovely weather, but by the but when the winter comes, we'll go on, right? So th this was this was some this was something that was established. You, and actually, this idea of fighting at certain times of the year is is a bit of the sh um, code of chivalry that was seen in the med in the medieval period. Okay, we won't invade we won't invade uh, Poland next week because it's getting to winter, right? And that's true. No word of a lie. No word of a lie. This is what Hitler and Napoleon could have learned something from. So, uh, so this is a bad time to invade in in August and September because winter's coming. It's, it's not. It's the end of the campaigning season. But Julius Caesar, this man, this this man is this really sort of wow. You know, just come on, boys, come and join me. 
he got together two Roman legions that were, that were very loyal to him. He summoned merchants. He probably said to the merchants, come on, bring all your goods over. Come on, bring them to me. And he basically, right, I can have your ships now and invade Britain. Um, so, you know, this, and, and then he said to some of the, um, he said to some of the merchants, right, he said, look, you know, what's Britain like, you know, and it's just help us, give, give us a little bit of a map, you know. So not only was he, he getting some intelligence from the merchants, he was using the merchant ships to invade Britain, right? So this, this is what's going to happen. Those are all merchant vessels, basically. Um, oh, don't we love these sort of like scenes? We really love them. There he is, Julius Caesar. There he is. He's got a big nose like me. Nobody can say I've got a big nose. I know I've got a big nose, but only I can say it. So in other words, what 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 basically he, he asked all these traders where to where where to where to land and and, and stuff. Um, and he sent he then sent a tribune sometime probably August whenever called Gaius Volusanus to scout the coast in a single warship. So not a, not a merchant ship, but a warship. He said that he probably examined the Kent coast between Hyde and Sandwich, but was unable to land. So he did not dare leave his ship and entrust himself to the barbarians. And after five days, returned to Caesar what intelligence he had managed alongside all the other intelligence he had gathered from merchants. Anyway, so uh, by then, ambassadors from some of the British straits, um, states, warned by merchants of the impending invasion, had arrived promising their submission. So in other words, before the, Britain, before the Romans invaded Britain, some of the British leaders had already surrendered. They said, hey, Julie! Julie, if you're going to come over, come to my estate, right? We'll give you grapes because grapes were grown in Britain at that time. We'll give you grapes, nice bit of wine. It's your wine, by the way, but you don't need to know, right? Um, yes, but, but I think we probably had our own wine at that stage. And he basically said, look, 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 Julie, right? Sort of, you know, um, we, 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 we're going to be, we're, we're going to help you. You know, that's fine. And there was a guy called Commius, king of the Atrobates. Um, and Commius has basically allied himself with Julius Caesar. So in other words, in a way, Julius Caesar had already captured Britain without even invading because um, lots of these tribal leaders had already surrendered. You know, I said, oh, you, you come over, it's fine, love it. Yeah. Come and have our wine. But actually, that, that gives a bit of a, a poor picture because there were lots of Britons going to be really peed off with the fact that Julius Caesar is going to, going to be invaded. So at this stage, what was the figure I gave earlier on? 628 ships, 630 odd ships, right? That was the second invasion in 54, the third invasion in 54 BC, right? Um, and, and basically, Julius Caesar, with just two legions, gathered together merchant and transport ships and, and men of war, 80 ships, 80 ships. And those 80 ships carried over uh, probably about 12, 15,000 men, right? It's still a lot to get in 80 ships, you know. Um, so and it's quite likely that the figure 80 is is a small figure, more like 100 odd. And it left the port of Boulogne. So what we need is a little bit of an image. There's good old Julie. Nice old Julie there. Hang on. There we go. Port of, port of Boulogne. Portus Iltius. Uh, Boulogne. Now, this was already being established as a port. Portus um, Iltius. There it is. Portus um, Itius. Iltius, Itius, Itius. Now, it may seem a bit odd that they've chosen a bit of coast that is further south. Um, they, they, they could have actually gone, uh, built a port at Calais. But the port at Portus um, Itius was already established at Boulogne. Um, and it might be that the, they used the port there because of the current. Right, they used the port there because of the current. Because if they used the port a bit further up, they may have got choppy currents. This is what happened in the Spanish Armada. The Spanish Armada was picking up soldiers in Calais, not Boulogne, right? And there was choppy seas and the, the, the Spanish army couldn't carry the army over to Britain. Things went pear-shaped, right? It's, all, it's, it's really difficult to invade Britain, right? It's really, really difficult to invade Britain. I, I've always had the question why, why the Germans didn't invade Britain. I, I've got most answers in my head for the Second World War, and I'm quite happy with them, right? But probably the reason why the Germans didn't invade Britain was because of the choppy seas. They probably wouldn't have got the army over here. Um, and if, if you think about it, Adolf Hitler always believed that the uh, British would actually uh, invade around Calais and, and, and Dunkirk, right? Not in Normandy. Yeah. Um, and one thing, one thing... Is about all about the currents. 
if, if you invade over the, the narrowest part, the currents are going to be quite vicious, right? And we're going to be really, really vicious. So you don't do that. Uh, it's it's 25, 25 miles 20, uh, from Calais over to Dover. And you're talking about 30 plus miles from uh, Boulogne. But that was the best option. Yeah. You can see the coast of Britain from there anyway. It's fine. Everything's all right. Let's 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 just do, get on with the invasion. It's late summer. Um, it's late summer, 55 BC. And this is what we're going to do. This this is the scene. Julius Caesar, there he is. Actually, he was probably set back in his, his in his vessel. He, he was probably, uh, he, he probably thought there's a stupid bastard in the water down there. Come on, boys, get over. And then Julius Caesar probably would have gone on. But he's, Julius Caesar is no coward. He's a leader of men. Uh, but naturally, he's not as fit as he's in his 20s. He's in his 30s at this point, remember. Um, he dies at the age of 55. This is 10 years earlier. He's, he's um, 45, my age. Uh, I'm not. I'm no spring chicken, right? But so, so, and actually, some of the headgear is not exactly right either. But this is what's going on. So back to this little bit of a plan Let, let's give you a little bit more detail so right where are we right what we've done we've decided to invade that's what we're going to do that's what we're going to be two legions we're going to do it there was there was transport vessels as well with all the food everything was there right and here we go clearly in a hurry to invade we've got to do this let's get on with it boys and the other thing is to get on with it is that the supplies ain't going to last forever in other words he needed to get the invasion over by christmas no 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 he needed to get the invasion over within about a month, because if he didn't get it over in a month, then, you know, the sea's going to get a bit choppy and, you know, mind my French, a bit pissy, you know. And it did. It really got bad within about a month. So he got that right. So he's invaded at the wrong time. Clearly in a hurry, Caesar himself um, left the garrison at the port and set out at the third watch well after midnight on the 23rd of August. Um with the legions uh, leaving the cavalry t um, to match their ships, embark and join him as soon as possible. In light of later events, this was either a um, tactical mistake. In other words, he was going to go in, right, with everything else coming in behind, right? Yeah, along with the fact that the legions came over without baggage or heavy siege gear, confirms the invasion was not intended for complete conquest. In other words, it was a feint. It was going to be a feint. It was going to be basically... What we're going to do, Richard, right? What we're going to do, Rich Babes, yeah, yeah. What we're going to do, I know you're, I, I know you're the legator, the, the general of the the um, seventh legion, and there's the general of the tenth legion, good old Dell over there, Dell. What, what we're going to do, nobody's going to know in Rome whether we conquered Britain or not. We're just going to tell them, right? Agreed? Job done. That's what we're going to do. Um, and that this was the idea, you know, because already people had said, you know, come on over, you know, come on, boys, it's all OK. Right? He thought it was going to be a walk in the park. Britain would be conquered in a month and he could go home and he would have conquered the whole of Britain. Right. That's what he wanted to say anyway. You know, um, so Julius Caesar initially tried to land at Dover. In other words, he couldn't land on the beaches at Dover. He wasn't right. Whose natural harbour had presumably been identified by Volsinius. The, the, the guy who'd been the guy who'd gone over a, a few 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 days before right to see where the suitable landing places are however when he came in sight of the shore the massed forces of the britons gathered up god i gotta do this right so um this this sounds appropriate now so we go back on that image right the, the massed forces are there on the cliffs at dover i tell you i'd be afraid of a woman with a spear christ almighty it must have been fearsome right um, so in other words, he didn't want to land at Dover because he saw all these people above, you know, probably with a bit of wood showing their tackle and breasts and everything else. Right. Um, it might encourage Dell to land, but it would be, it would be bloody fearsome. Um, so he was dissuaded from landing at the um, cliffs of Dover, right. Even though there's a natural little bay, uh, projectiles being thrown on him and big lumps of chalk. It would have made his hair white. He didn't want that. Right? He wasn't going to go grey too soon. Since the cliff was so close to the shore that javelins could be thrown down from them onto anyone landing there. After waiting there at anchor until the ninth hour, about 3 p.m., waiting for his supply ships from the second port to come up. And meanwhile, convening a council of war, he ordered his subordinates to act on their own initiative and then sailed the fleet about seven miles northeast 
um, along the coast to an open beach. The first level beach area after Dover is uh, Walmart, uh, Walmart Bay, Walmart Beach, um, seven miles sort of east along the coast. There you go. Go, go uh, recent archaeology by the University of, of Leicester indicates the possible landing place was probably Pegwell Bay, uh, Thanet, Kent, which is a bit further on, uh, where um, artifacts and massive earthworks dating from that period have been exposed. Although this area would not have been the first easy landing place, the one is is the one at Walmer Bay, a bit further on up the coast. Let's have a look at that, that map again. Let's just get that up there so we know where we're going. Oh, they're quite fearsome, those women. Flipping out red air, that's enough to frighten anyone. Oh, God. Um, so what we're talking about, he was going to land up there. He's showing Dover. So a little bit further on the coast is showing their deal. So this, this is this is going to be the ideal place, the ideal place to land. Right. That's where we're going to go. Um, but places, ideas where he landed changed. So we, we know it's a bit whether we got deal, whether we got Pegwell Bay, where, whether we got Walmart, it's somewhere along there where, where he's going to land. Right. So if Caesar had a had as large a fleet with him as has been suggested, from over 100, 150, 160 ships, whatever, then it is, it is possible that the beaching of ships would have been spread out over a number of miles stretch. So in other words, you can imagine, uh, you can imagine along that stretch of coastline, there's all these ships being beached up on, you know, very vulnerable, right? Very vulnerable. Um, hang on, let's just sort of, um, oh, here we go. Yeah, there we go, beached on the beach. Oh, I can't get the image I wanted. Anyway, what, what we're saying, you can imagine, uh, these trireme vessels, you know, beached, you know, they're beached up. So in other words, they're going to be buggered. You know, they're not going to be able to go anywhere after that. You know, they're, 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 uh, they, they, this is a coin from wonderful Julius Caesar. And that, that, that's uh, that that's sort of um, um, the world of Augustus, not the world of Julius Caesar, because the, the bits still need to be conquered. Uh, and there, there you go. There they are landing. That, that, that's, that's that famous blokey, right? There, there, there's that famous blokey, the Signifer. Anyway, go back to the story. Let's get back into the story again, right? Uh, back again into having been tracked all the way along the coast by the British cavalry and chariots, the landing was opposed. To make matters worse, the loaded Roman ships were too low in the water to go close inshore, and the troops had to disembark in deep water, all the while attacked by the enemy from the shallows. The troops were reluctant, but according to Caesar's own accounts, um, it's um, it, it, um, I've referred to it as a Signifer. They're referred to it as Qualifa, a um, standard bearer whose name is not provided by Caesar of the Tenth Legion, who jumped in for uh, in first as an example. The so standard bearer with the standard himself. Let's just show the standard there. There it is, the standard in all these illustrations. There he is. Uh, we'll call him. We'll call him Richard. Richard, the standard bearer, right? There he is, Richard, and there he is. I'm not going to look over there because they're all naked and they're painted in woad, right? To be honest with you, a warrior naked, painted in woad, is a bit exposed, don't you think? It it, it might be the the in thing to do, but it, you know. But anyway, the Signifer, there, there he is. Uh, the Quiffola Signifer, standard bearer. There he is. Um, there he is. He's, he's there. Um, and he says, you can imagine in, in Latin, leap fellow soldiers, unless you wish to betray your eagle to the enemy. I, for my part, will perform my duty to the Republic and to my general. How the hell did he manage to shout all that while he jumped off the vehicle, uh, off the boat? There's choppy seas. There's all these bloody spears and stuff being chucked at you. It's absolute hell. But there he is. He shouts that. Maybe what he said was, bugger this. It's choppy seas. I'm jumping in, lads, if you like it or not. And there he went in and joined him, you know. Anyway, Judas see. Judas Caesar probably wasn't even in that vessel. He they jumped from anyway. He was probably freaking over there. Anyway, it's a nice little bit of a story. Anyway, the British were eventually driven back by by catapults and slings fired from the warships. This is a Hollywood movie, isn't it? But more of a Disney sort of Pirates of the Caribbean thing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, into the oh or as as um as a notable Barry archaeologist would call it, Richard. A trebuchet. Richard's gone to sleep. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I meant Richard.
Richard's gone to sleep. <laughs> Were you sleeping then, Richard? <laughs> I can't even hear him. Anyway, so in other words, they all jumped off the vessels and they all managed to get into formation. And then the cavalry that was meant to land with them was delayed by adverse winds, still had not arrived, so the Britons could not be pursued and finished off. And Caesar could not enjoy what he calls, in his usual self-promoted style, his accustomed success. <laughs> so in other words, success wasn't instant. It wasn't there. It wasn't going to happen. It wasn't happening. The beachhead. So obviously we've all heard about the beachhead. Now that this is this is what we talk about in, for example, with um the D Day landings, for example. The 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 um Omaha uh, beach. Um that that needs to be a beachhead for, for the Americans and um and it's that word beachhead is always used. A beachhead has to be established for you to bring your supplies in for you to be able to conquer anywhere. If you don't secure a beachhead, you are buggered. The Romans established a temporary camp on the beach of which archaeological traces are believed to have been found by Leicester University or wherever that was. Received ambassadors and had com Commius, Commius, the leader of the Atrobates. I had to say it, Atrobates. <laughs> uh, the Atrobates, you've got to say it, Atrobates, it sounds so good. Um, who had been arrested as soon as he had arrived in Britain, returned to them. So in other words, um, so received ambassadors and had Commius. So in other words, what had happened is that when Commius went over to Britain, I'll start again, get my words out. When Commius had gone over to the Romans and said, look, the Atrobates will fight with you and, and we will be part of whatever you want to do with Rome. When Commius got over to Britain, they said you... You spineless, two-faced cretin! And they arrested Commius, right? But what happened is Julius Caesar said, I want my friend Commius. I want some ambassadors. And they all went to the feet of Julius Caesar. And they said, look, please, leave us alone. We will give you tribute. And use that bastard, Commius. You can have him. Julius Caesar claimed he was negotiating from a position of strength. And that the British leaders blaming their attacks on him, on the common people. It wasn't us. It was those over there. Oh, by the way, they're all dead. They can't speak for themselves. We didn't. We, it wasn't my idea. Nothing. And we accidentally arrested Commius. It's a bit like a play from, from something that you wouldn't really get these days. In four days, uh, awed into giving hostages. Uh, so we'd be, in other words, what... what <laughs> What the leaders said, the ambassadors said, I tell you what, right? These guys over here, you keep them as hostages and we won't attack anymore, right? <laughs> not not um, ostriches, but hostages. It's the same difference. Um, so in other words, it was said that now you 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 native Britons, right? You, you give us hostages, and if you if you kill any of my men, right, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna hurt some of the hostages, right? So um, so basically um the cavalry right that this was this was the problem now right so in other words everything was fine right um you know Julius Caesar you know told the native Britons look disband your armies but one thing the one thing he didn't know that's this the sense of strength was his 2000 cavalry was not to happen. The cavalry did not land. They, they, they. You could see, right? Oh, you can imagine this, can't you? Bugger this for a game of soldiers, and they all decided to go back to Boulogne, right? They all go, but decided to go back to Boulogne. So the cavalry never ever landed, right? Julius Caesar was furious because with the cavalry was some more food supplies, right? Caesar, um, in his narrative, said that he was taken by surprise by high tides and a storm. He beached warships and they were filled with water and his transports um, riding at anchor were driven against each other. Some ships were wrecked and many others were rendered unseaworthy unsea by the loss of rigging or other vital equipment threatening the return journey. So realising this and hoping to keep Caesar in Britain over the winter and thus stab him into submission. So in other words, this was the way to get their own back, right? The Britons thought, right, 
we've got we've got just uh, Julius Caesar on the back foot now. His cavalry didn't turn up. He's no big guy now. All his boats have been bloody wrecked. Nah, 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 nah. So the Britons decided that they were going to keep Julius Caesar on the beaches, starve Julius Caesar into submission, and then, um, and then basically um, they were going to uh, use Julius Caesar's army as hostages then, and make sure that Julius Caesar's never ever you know landed um, in Britain again. But but the the Roman Julius Caesar was sort of used to he wasn't used to failure, but he had had failures in his life. So in other words, they started to forage for food, and the foraging party uh, was relieved by the uh, remainder of the Roman forces. So in other words, eventually some more Roman soldiers actually arrive with food, and only um, several days of storms with a large force um, gathered together to attack, attack the Roman camp. But the Romans were ready. This attack was fully driven off in a bloody bout, um, and in other words, Commius had gathered an army to support the Romans. So Commius was now a Roman puppet. You know, it, it was a bad idea to have um, given Commius um, his freedom. So he gathered all pro-Roman Britons and they were helping the Romans. Conclusion, the British once again sent ambassadors and Caesars Although he doubled the number of hostages, realised he could not hold out any longer and dared not risk a, a stormy winter crossing. So Caesar had set up, um, set out late in the campaign season. The winter was approaching. And so he allowed them to, to be delivered. Um, so in other words, what he said, he said, right, OK, well, we, we conquered Britain. He didn't actually leave the beach. We conquered Britain. We've got all these hostages. Commius is now our leader in Britain. That's it. So in other words, they, they, um, so what happened is that uh, Judas Caesar, with his hostages and the support of Commius, um, most of the main body of men actually got back to Britain. That was the invasion. That was the end of the first invasion. Right? That was the end of the first invasion. But there was to be... The, um, if you want to call it the second invasion or the third invasion, the last invasion in 54 BC, that was what was going to happen, right? Actually, the, these these Britons here are actually have, have got clothes on. Doesn't he look bloody ugly with that woad on his face? Flipping egg. Anyway, so uh, this is about the second invasion, right? Or the third invasion, the last. We call it the last invasion, right? This uh, you can see that the that the Roman armor is slightly different, right? This this is earlier Roman armor, right? In later Roman armor, the cheek plates are slightly wider, and um, and, and and the headgear is is usually made of iron or it, it, it's it, we've actually seen leather caps as well being used. Julius Caesar's invasion of Britain, solving a two thousand year old mystery. So this is where we're going to go next. So. Uh, where are we? All oh, right, here we go. So this this is the invasion of 54 BC, right? Now Julius Caesar didn't invade later on in the year. He invaded earlier on in the year, at, in, in the beginning of July, uh, 6th of July, and ended on the 3rd of September. So there we go. He landed like further on up the up at the coastline near a place called Ebb's Fleet, got through to Canterbury, got through to fording across the River Thames, and defeating the the British leader Cassivellaunus. He was leader of the combined Trinovantes, Catavalani tribe, um, and the um, the Ikeen Iron and the tribes in that area. So, if we go back again, you know, you get all these wonderful little bits of illustrations and and what's going on, um, and you know that that's where the next invasion is going to be. Ebb's fleet sandwich. This is going to be invasion inland, you know, and all the way up to say Verulanium, and then they would head back. Um, it, it's yeah. Obviously, we got we got ideas being chucked around about elephants being used, and I mean, one elephant would have been enough, basically. Just chuck one elephant on a boat, right? That would have scared the British into submission. Like this freaking thing, they wouldn't have seen an elephant before. <laughs> anyway, uh, we know elephants were used in one of the invasions. Anyway, whether elephants were definitely used now is 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 up for debate. So. 
Um, so fine, this this last invasion. So in other words, Julius Caesar basically said, "Oh, um, uh, I invaded Britain. Um, Commius is now a guy over there, and uh, you know it, it all went well. We, we've uh, we've gone beyond the known world of Rome, uh, of, of of Rome, and we've, we've gone to Britain." Uh, Caesar's pretext for the invasion was that in almost all the wars with the Gauls, uh, they they would always be helped. Um, and Julius Caesar decided that we was going to have another invasion, right? The last invasion, the second invasion. So again, sixth of July, but that that was actually um, probably a whole month, if not a month and a half, before the other invasion, which was the end of August. Um, so a second invasion, this last invasion, third invasion, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, what what's happened is um, um, the, the the what's happened um, is that uh, this crossing itself was going to be of an immense scale. It was going to involve eight hundred or more ships. Right. Um, my other uh, that's what Julius Caesar quotes. The, the other quote that I've given you is 627, 628, 630 ships. Right. What, however many number of ships it would have needed to have been quite a fleet. Right. That's a lot of ships. I tell you what, 200 ships is a lot of ships. Even if you over, even if it, the figures were doubled by Julius Caesar. Right. It's still 400 ships. Right. Still a lot of bloody ships. Yeah. So there's a lot going on. Um, so determined not to make the mistakes of the previous year. Right. Julius Caesar gathered a large force um, than on a previous expedition. Five legions, not two. Five. Five legions. Um, and what? And 2,000 cavalry, only 2,000 cavalry, but they would have been enough to flighten the daylights out of anyone. Um, so this time, the crossing and landing. Um, there, along with the crossing, um, with the crossing, there was an individual um, um, who was left behind. To see that that food would be sent over on a regular basis, and that guy by the name of Titus Labanius, 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 Titus Labanius, L A B I E M U S, Labanius, Titus Labanius, he would be left behind to make sure he'd look after the food supplies, so it'd be a regular supply of food. And this is exactly what the Germans would have had to have done in the Second World War to have invaded Britain. Invading Britain, right? So would have needed. Um, probably around at least 100,000 men for the Germans to have invaded. And then on a regular basis, they would have needed supplies every single day. And without being able to get those supplies over to Britain, the German army would have been trapped here. As Julius Caesar was seeing with the previous invasion in 55 BC, if he didn't get back, he would be trapped in Britain without supplies. But this time he was invading early and he left behind somebody who was competent enough to to make sure uh, that food would be available. So upon landing. Um, so there we go. Um, so we're landing there. Sandwich Bay. Yeah. So th this is the this is the earlier invasion. And actually. Julius Caesar did everything that I said not to do. Um, <laughs> He invaded from Calais. He invaded from Calais. Not the line where the currents weren't as bad. He decided because it's summer, right? Because it's summer, the currents ain't going to be that choppy if, he, if, there's, if there's an invasion from Calais. But instead of going direct where he would have been in the stop, choppy flows of the channel, he decided to use the choppy flows to go a little bit further north and then back in again up to Sandwich Bay. And that's exactly what he decided to do. And he was successful, very successful. So what he wanted to do, as soon as he got to the beachhead, he left a, comp a very competent individual, Quintus Atreus, behind on the beachhead, right, a commander, um, and then if he come across any anybody attacking, right, the camp would be looked after, right? So probably, we don't really know, but I would guess that Julius Caesar took with him about four, four Roman legions, 30,000 men, leaving about 5,000 behind to deal with all the supplies and all everything, right? 
and supply lines. Supply lines in warfare is very important, right? I know Pat is it, um, idolizes Sherman and his march to the sea from Atlanta <laughs> all the way through um, to um, South Carolina in the American Civil War. And um, Sherman had a policy of scorched earth that there would be no supply lines. Everything behind him would be burnt, right? That was Sherman with wagons and carts and all the rest of it. Julius Caesar, with his invasion of Britain, he needed supply lines. And they needed to be secured. And the base of the beachhead of the supply lines was to be kept secure by a Roman legion. So this, this was a very different invasion. This was very different than what had happened before. Now, we believe, we believe that he managed to get to what's referred to as the River Stour, right? The River Stour, right? Um, and there was there was there were groupings of native Britain there. And he defeated them. He kicked butt, right? Uh, there was there was a uh, there was a, a place. Um, if, if, we, if we look, we, we look at the map, right? It was called it was called Big Bree. Place called Big Bree, Big Big Bree Wood. It's a bit, bit of a hell for, right? So we scattered the tribes. They went every bloody way, everywhere, right? So crossing the River Stour. Um, as it was late in the day, and Julius Caesar was unsure of the territory, he called off the pursuit and made camp. Um, you know, um, it, this is probably the best thing to do. Don't fight, fight them, you know. Um, so remember, it's not far off the 6th of July now. You know, the next morning, as he prepared to advance further, Caesar received word from Atreus that once again, his ships at anchor had been dashed against each other in the storm and suffered considerable damage. About 40, he says, were lost. The Romans were unused to Atlantic and tidal, tidal storms. Um, so even at Sandwich Bay, it's, it's, it's not good. Um, and storms but nevertheless considered the damage he had sustained the previous year. This was poor planning on Caesar's part. However, Caesar may have exaggerated the number of ships. Basically, what Caesar wanted to do against advert adversity losing 40 of his ships right 80 of his ships 100 ships I tell you what let's put a thousand ships lost there right he was still going on with the invasion so you know no, yeah what he was trying to say was that he had to get on with it he wasn't going back without conquering britain this time he was going to get on with it he wasn't going to run away so the only way forward was forward so, um, however, however, instead of continuing the pursuit, he actually returned to the coast um, and basically said, look, you know, Atreus, um, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, what we're going to do, right? He returned to Atreus and he said, no, I know we've lost these vessels, right? Instead of leaving men behind, he had taken the legion that Atreus had with him and he said look we're gonna do it this time <laughs> but some men were left behind anyway to help you know is um you know this, this is what's happening right they repaired some of the vessels before he left so by the first by the first of se september now uh, by the first of september um obviously he's gone back and forth and all the rest of it right um so this is we've, we've jumped the gun a little bit. He's, he's writing on the 1st of, of, of September, right? He's writing to Cicero, his friend, and he's saying um, uh, and he's and he's writing back and forth. So obviously, Judas is going back to the bases and, 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 and continuing. So we don't know when we before the, the 1st of September, right? Sometime around that bit, Caesar then returned to the Stour crossing and found the Britons and massed their forces there. Um, Casa Valanus, um, a warlord from the north of the Thames, had previously been at war uh, with most of the British tribes. He had recently overthrown the powerful king of the Trinovantes, Mandrabracus, who, um, who had gone into exile. This is that Mandra Mandrabracus that we, we mentioned who would eventually begin, become the king of the Trinovantes, thanks to Julius Caesar again. So what had happened is basically Julius Caesar, there were some pitched battles. Right. There were some pitch battles, um, but small pitch battles, you know, not 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 with a big, big side, not with a big army that Casa Villanus had. It, it was not with a big, huge pitch battle, a small little pitch battle, because every time that Julius Caesar got closer to the big army of Casa Villanus, 
Casavalanus retreated further on towards the Thames, right? Kept going further on towards the Thames, all the way to the Thames. So there was these little pitch battles, but all the way to the Thames. By the time Julius Caesar reached the Thames, the one fordable place available to him had been fortified with sharpened stakes, both on the shore and under the water, and the far bank was defended. Second century sources state that uh, Julius Caesar used a large war elephant, which was equipped with armour and carried archers and slingers in its tower to put the defenders to flight. When this, when this unknown creature entered the river, the Britons and their horses fled, and the Roman army crossed over and entered Cassavarian's territory. So in other words, where are we now? So by, by probably the 1st of September, right, uh, we're here, Brentford. So there we are. Um, and and he, he needs to pursue the armies of Cassavalanus. Long story short, Cassavalanus gathers where, where the arrow is, at, at, at Virulanium. Um, and and what what's happening is that uh, um, here we go. The Trinovantes, whom Caesar described as the most powerful tribe in the region, who had recently suffered at um, Cassivellaunus' hands, sent ambassadors promising aid and provisions. Mandrabracus, who had been the king of the Trinovantes, who had accompanied uh, uh, Caesar, was restored as their king, and the Trinovantes provided grain and hostages. So, in other words. Julius Caesar didn't realize, but everything was happening in his way. He had he had burnt his bridges in a way. He had he had continued fight. He had continued against the Britons, knowing that his all his ships weren't repaired if he needed to leave. So other tribes had decided to side with Julius Caesar. Not only were the Trinovantes, there was the Canig Magni tribe and the Segogatarchi tribe. The Ataclito tribe, the Brachaikai tribe, the Kassai tribe, all these little tribes in the in the region had actually decided to side with Julius Caesar. And they gave away Cassivalanus's location uh, at Wheat Hampstead, which was with which was near the later city of um Verulanium. Verulanium. So in other words, what was happening? Um that Cassavalanus basically sent sent word to all his tri all his tribal friends to to fight the Romans. Now's the time. If we don't fight the Romans now, we're going to lose Britain. Well, Cassavalanus wanted wanted to be wanted to be king of the Trinovantes again. You know, um, so what happened is that the the assaults on the Romans didn't work. Casavellano sent ambassadors to negotiate the surrender. Caesar was eager to return to Gaul for the winter to due, um, for the winter due to growing unrest there, and an agreement was mediated be, uh, by Commius. Casavellano gave hostages, agreed an annual tribute, and undertook not to war against Madrebracus uh, or the Trinovantes, because Madrebracus was the king that the, the Romans had put in to rule over the Trinovantes. So, in other words. Uh, Julius Caesar is said to have written to um, Cicero on the 26th of September, confirming the result of the campaign with, with hostages, but no booty taken, and that the army was about to return to Gaul. Oh. He then left, leaving not a single Roman soldier in Britain to enforce his settlement. Whether the tribute was ever paid is unknown. So in other words, he based his victory over the Britons on the fact that the Britons had surrendered. So um, what what happens is that the um, in, in in history as well it said uh, we're just we're just um, oh, by the way guys I am absolutely wasted. Um, so basically defeats on the Britons led by Cassivellaunus in East Anglia. There we go. We've got all the locations there, the, the battles, the Canterbury, the Ebbs Fleet where they landed. Julius Caesar got to there. Um, when Casavellano surrendered, um, it said that the tribute of the kings of Britain was laid at the feet of Julius Caesar and the surrender. But we don't. But Julius Caesar says that no booty was 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 ever given to him. So what happened to that booty? Julius Caesar probably kept some of it for himself and distributed it around the Roman soldiers that had actually fought with him. Because the Roman soldiers would have deserved that. So, 
So there we go. This is the campaign. By the 3rd of September, he's defeated Casavalanus. Defeated it. Defeated Casavalanus. Um, and there we go. There's Casavalanus at the feet of Julius Caesar saying, I surrender. I surrender. I surrender Britain to you. It wasn't. Britain was not Casavalanus's to surrender to Julius Caesar. But guess what, folks? Julius Caesar didn't know that at all. <laughs> It's a bit like uh, it's a bit like um, let, let me come up with an example, right? Uh, Richard Richard nicks a car in Barry, right? <laughs> which 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 he's done a few times in his time. You know, we both have. You know, worked on you know hijacking cars. It's a bit like Richard saying, "I've got a car for you, yeah, Carl." There's the um, the owner certificate in the glove compartment. Take it away, Carl. And I drive away with it, right? And it's my car, right? But it wasn't Richard's to give to me, was it, Richard? Just because you stole it, it doesn't mean to say that you can give it to me, does it? And actually, that's the thing. Casavalanos had stolen the territory of the Trenovantes in the first place, right? But Julius Caesar was happy enough. Happy enough that the people that he as a representative of the Britons had surrendered to him. And there's also a little bit of history saying that um, 10 of the kings of Britain had surrendered um, to Julius Caesar. Um, and, and just sort of in, in sort of finishing this sort of the aftermath, finally, the last word today, the aftermath. Commius. The great supporter of the Romans. Guess what he did? When the Romans buggered off back to when the Romans buggered off back to um, Gaul, Commius switched sides again to support Vertin Getrix. Have you noticed Commius seems to be on the losing side all the time? You know, he, he, he he's on the Roman losing side because the Romans go back in the first, you know, in that invasion in 50, 55. He's then handed over to the Romans. Um, he then, he then fights alongside the Romans only for the Romans to leave. Now he's on the losing side again. So he decides, oh, my, my friends, bollocks to this. I'm going to, I'm going to help Vertin Getterix. So he sides with Vertin Getterix. And guess what happens to Vertin Getterix? Because you guys know, Vertin Getterix loses, right? So after a number of unsuccessful engagements with uh, Julius Caesar, um, he cuts his losses and, and, and in other words, Vertin get, um, um, Commius has no friends, in other words. He, he's got no friends. Um, so so what, what, what's happening then is that um, late, later, on in, in, uh, later on in history, Commius establishes a dynasty in Hampshire. He, he returns back to Britain, right? After helping Vertin Ketterix, he returns back to Britain. Um, and he starts to, uh, lots of coins are produced. And Verica, the king, whose exile prompted Claudius's conquest, AD 43, styled himself a son of Commius. So, in other words, Verica, who was a self styled <coughs> son of Commius, who then later sided with the Romans, Verica sided with the Romans, fled to the Romans for help to invade Britain. Um, so in other words, Verica didn't know where he was anyway. So in other words, um, eventually you've got uh, Julius Caesar, uh, not Julius Caesar, the the um, the memory of Julius Caesar feeds. But eventually Claudius invades in AD 43, I believe. But Cal Caligula invades a couple of years earlier as well. Uh, there's a final invasion of Britain and that invasion conquers Britain. There you go. Britain's part of the Roman Empire. Job done. Bob's your uncle. Right. Fanny's your aunt. I'm going to ask if there's any questions. Come on, Dal, you know you want to ask one. No, no questions, just say thanks. It's good to it's good for you, Dal for you to be along for the duration today. Um, right, so anything you'd like to say about our Julius Caesar, uh, Richard? No, no. Very interesting. Oh, that is that all? <laughs> you you boring bunch of mogadons. Well, I could, you know. <laughs> All right, then. I tell you what, right? We haven't had a female perspective today, right? <laughs> Either I wear Pat's dress or she wears mine. So over to you, Pat. Well, I thought it was fantastic. I, 
but you acted the part as well. So it's amazing. Very, very interesting. I appreciate that. Good, good. I wanted to know about that, that machine that came across uh, overcoming um, stakes with uh, sharp points and uh, people on the other side of the, you know, what was this machine? What did, how did it they... was the elephant. Was it an elephant? I thought the, you said machine, the, the, the elephant was the machine. That, <laughs> was, that was what went over the Thames. <laughs> but it was like a, a, the machine of war. It was the elephant. Oh, but didn't he get stuck on the, the, the sharp sticks? You know, I mean, that sharp oh, stick. is clad in armor. <laughs> oh, okay. Not not if he's clad in armor. Actually, actually, um, <laughs> it, it's it's like it's likely that the um, the, 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 the the thing the thing is the this elephant's not going to be stupid, is it? So it's it's it, it's like it's like the German invasion of France, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? The elephant's going to be taller in the water than people going across. So the Britons are going to expect. That the Romans are going to go over the shallow bit, and that's where they put the spikes, right? Uh, but the elephant did what the Germans did in the Second World War. It just went a bit further north and just walked into uh, France like that. So the elephant went a bit further on in the water and just waded across. So one elephant did it, huh? One <laughs> elephant could do it, exactly. <laughs> and he came on that ship. <laughs> exactly, exactly, it came on a ship. Uh, I'm going to say one thing. I need to have a chat with Dell at the end just quickly. But yeah, any other questions, uh, Pat, before we all go? No, that, I did get a bit confused because I don't know all the names. I don't know who they are, but um, I, I got the gist. So well, you. basically, this communist bloke, he was a bit of a turncoat, right? He was yeah. always on the loot's inside. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> Do you, do, you know, do you know what? In, in, in my life, I've always been on the blooming loot's side. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, if Richard hasn't got any questions, Richard, we will see you on Friday. Dal, you've got Jessica tomorrow. Pat, yep. you've got um, Jessica tonight. Yep. Um, oh, Bill, Bill was Bill, Bill's Bill's always bloody spoiling it by asking about <laughs> money. So I'll just uh, you guys haven't got to pay for this for um, there's another three to go if you wanted to continue. But no, nothing about money today. Okay. Um, right. I won't. I won't say anything next week. Just keep leave it to the week after. But if, um, I want, just want a quick uh, one minute with Dal. But if there's no other questions, um, Pat, I'll. Uh, we'll see you soon next week, and to Richard, to you Friday, and we'll go from there. Thank you very much. If there's no more questions, thank you. Bye. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye. 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 Guys. Yeah. Bye. 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 Richard. Um, right. I'm going to end the recording, Dal. It's just one thing. I just want to quickly ask you. Bye. Um. Oh God, Dal. I'm having a blonde moment. Right, okay, we'll end the recording. Three, two, one.